Hey everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Spencer Rukti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Uh, on behalf of the store, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Miriam Taves and Lydia Kiesling. We're here to discuss Miriam's magnificent new novel, Fight Night. Uh, first of all, I want to invite all of you tonight uh, to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, go ahead, say hello. Tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, and second, uh, I want to say that through virtual events like today's, uh, Third Place Books is so fortunate to continue connecting readers with authors in an intimate setting. Uh, we sorely miss having authors in our stores, of course, especially on nights like tonight, but at the same time, we're grateful to have this new platform that brings our growing event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, we are proud to host a number of very exciting virtual events this fall, um, which you can find on our website. Um, on October 12th, we have Jonathan Franzen for his new novel, Crossroads, in conversation with Maria Semple. We have Joshua Ferris with Amy Bender on the 13th, discussing Josh's marvelous new book, uh, A Calling for Charlie Barnes. Um, we have Jess Walter on October 15th to celebrate the paperback release of The Cold Millions. Uh, we have virtual nights nearly every night of the week, uh, and for reminders on those uh, events and more, I encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter at thirdplacebooks.com. Uh, as I mentioned before, the chat window is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it is open, and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, tonight, we will also have some time for your questions, so if you have questions for our authors tonight, please submit those in the Q&A window below. Uh, we also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. You just have to hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen uh, to turn those on or off. Um, overall, thank you so much for sticking around with us during this virtual era. It is really strictly because of you that this author series is even possible. And now uh, let's introduce tonight's speakers. Miriam Taves is the author of seven previous novels, including Women Talking, All My Puny Sorrows, Summer of My Amazing Luck and a Complicated Kindness, as well as one work of nonfiction, Swing Low, A Life. I would love to go through and describe uh, the enormous presence of Taves' novels uh, one by one, but of course we don't have time. Um, her work, though, is philosophical and incredibly in the moment. It is uproariously funny, uh, rapturous, and thoughtful in a way that is entirely unique in English letters, in my opinion. Uh, her novels really do reach out and touch everything around them, and her novel, uh, her new novel out this week, Fight Night, is no exception. Uh, Miriam Taves is the winner of the Governor General's Award for Fiction, the Libris Award for Fiction, <coughs> uh, for Fiction Book of the Year, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and the Writers Trust Ingle Finley Award. Miriam Taves is joining conversation, uh, conversation tonight by Lydia Kiesling, who is calling us from Portland, Oregon, and is the author of the novel the Golden State, a 2018 National Book Foundation 5 under 35 honoree and a finalist for the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, and Cut. Uh, and I'll just say as a general rule, if I see one of Lydia's essays on my Twitter timeline, I will always click. Tonight, they are both here to talk about Miriam's latest novel, Fight Night, which is a book about one precocious young girl's relationship with her mother and her sour and delightful grandmother, Elvira. Uh, Elvira. And uh, this is an invigorating work about family that the Globe and Mail calls an incredible, relentless, resilient life force. Um, it is also, uh, I will also add before uh, we move on to the conversation, it also, Swiv, uh, the protagonist of the book, delivers some of my favorite lines of the year. Uh, such as this quote, um, it doesn't matter what words you use in life, it's not going to prevent you from suffering. So with that, I can't wait to join in watching this conversation with all of you tonight. Please join me in welcoming Miriam Taves and Lydia Kiesling. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Thank Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. Hi, Thank Lydia. you, Spencer. <laughs> Um, well, Miriam, thank you so much for doing this event um, and sharing, for doing this event. sharing this wonderful book with us. Um, and Spencer, that was such a, a beautiful introduction. And Spencer and Third Place Books have been so organized and made everything so easy for us. Um, so thank you so much for that. 
Um, I, I'm going to start by saying that I just, I apologize in advance. I have no control over any of the um, creatures in my house. So like whenever I do anything in a Zoom thing, there's always like a child or a cat. So if I stand up suddenly, that's, I'm just opening the door or closing it and I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. I've got a similar situation here. I, I don't know. There are various generations of pages <laughs> moving around. <laughs> Um, well, hopefully we'll get, you know, maybe we'll get like a, a surprise, a bonus Taves visit. Um, I, for the audience members, thank you so much for being here. And I'm, I am doubly privileged because I got to speak with Miriam when, in person, um, in another time, uh, when Women Talking came out and she came to San Francisco. Um, so I'm so delighted to be here um, to talk about this new novel, which is just a beautiful book. Um, I read it this summer. I read a galley and um, was on a family trip and I wept at the end. Um, and it was just a, such a cathartic and um, amazing reading experience. Experience. Um, so I wonder if maybe you could um, read a selection. Um, yes. Oh my goodness. Look, I'm just I'm screwing this up right from right from the. <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to be reading. Um, do you want to, do Do you want to wait for like ten seconds? Never mind. Let's. Well, we can chat and then and then we can take a, we can take a break. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Oh, I'm an idiot. Oh my god, I'm just not fit for these things. I no, apologize. We, you're very fit for them. Um, I just, I do, I want at some point you to read because it's such a voice driven novel and I think it would be like such a um, rare pleasure for I, the, us I to hear you your to, voice. The book is just right, like right in the other room. So, you know, whenever you want me to get it, I'll, like I'll run. Okay. You know, five seconds of. <laughs> okay, we'll do, let's do one question. We'll do one question and then that will elegantly segue. <laughs> into, <laughs> Oh, I love that. <laughs> um, see, this is this is what you what you pay for um, with these uh, these yeah. Zoom events. Yeah. Everyone, this my, is, ap my apologies. No, okay. this is the magic. This is the magic. The process in in action. Um, <laughs> yeah, you get to see our like beautiful decor and. <laughs> um, <laughs> so to bring the book that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, they they believe that it's true. And I wanted to know because I I was reading some kind of reviews and things today. So it was, it's a final, oh, also I have to say, if you see my eyes roving, it's not because I'm like, you know, texting. Or I'm just, I have my questions like written down in a little box thing on my <laughs> computer. So um, the novel is also a finalist for the Giller Prize and the Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Prize, which are huge um, awards. So congratulations on those. Um, okay, so my one, my one question that will elegantly segue into reading is, um, so, you know, this is a very voice-driven novel. Um, it's narrated by Swiv, um, who is a delightful, precocious, rambunctious, troubled, amazing child. Um, and so she's kind of mediating her experience of living with her grandmother and mother, um, and her father is MIA, um, and she's also kind of speaking to him. Uh, and she just has these wonderful turns of phrase, you know, both hers and then sort of imbricated her, her mother and grandmother's ways of speaking. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking of the other novels of yours that I've read and women talking. Um, and then the other novel I was thinking of as I was reading is um, All My Puny Sorrows, which are also, you know, first person and they have a pronounced voice, but you keep them all so beautifully, you know, their own kind of whole worlds. And I'm just on a craft level. How, how do you, how, um, how do you um, kind of conceive of that voice and, and find a way to sort of give it, give it its own book um, and sort of think so clearly in different first person registers that way. I really admire it. <laughs> I think that um, it is a, so. It, I, it it takes me quite a quite a while to to. It takes me a long time actually to figure out how to how to tell the story that I that I want to tell. And in this case, um, I kind of knew, you know, more or less the story that I wanted to tell with you know the themes, similar themes that I'm you know often <laughs> writing about, and um, or always writing about. And um, and I and I fig I had to figure out how to you know, as you know, figure out how to, like, how to tell that story, and who would, who would tell that story, and who would take us through the story, and it took me a long time to, um, because I started off, 
as I so often do, writing from the point of view of a you know a woman my age, um, an older woman, a grandmother, and it, you know, and um, it just wasn't. I don't know. There was something that I I was restricted. I felt restricted in some in some way, and uh, it just didn't seem natural and it wasn't flowing and so i had to think again and and um i can't remember exactly the day or the moment but um but i think i i just thought i would try you know to write from from the kids and i didn't even know really how old she she was going to be um i remembered myself as a nine-year-old and that was a really for me like a really exciting pivotal time in my life just between you know my earlier years when i was so really in my mind in my memory so carefree you know not a worry in the world and and i just thought i had you know the world by the time and then i and then i turned nine and suddenly i was kind of um you know just up like i i was worried i was anxious i felt i, fe I still felt free to a certain degree but i suddenly was aware of, I, a little bit aware of what was going on um and i thought you know what what is going on what the hell is going on in this town and you know in in with in my family you know inside of me um uh, in my body in you know and and um so i just kind of wanted to capture that you know that that sort of in, in between cuspy space and so um so then i thought okay i'll write from this point of view of this night of this nine-year-old girl and then it just kind of felt right and so i i, I continued but that, but you're right i mean that was the biggest the biggest challenge for sure, but with the book was to you know to stay in 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 the head of an of you know a troubled kind of freaky weird you know nine year old girl. Yeah. She's just an unforgettable narrator. So yes, I would love if you could go to fetch your copy. <laughs> I'll be right back. I, Thank I you. <laughs> Um, so participants, while I have you, um, or attendees, I'm a participant, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the Zoom boxes here. So um, attendees, wonderful attendees, if you are thinking of questions as, oh, and she's back, just if you have a question, drop it in the Q&A and I will read it toward the end of our session. I just had to run back to, um, actually to my, my mother, I'm in my mother's space now because I don't have internet in my space, I was talking about this. So mm -hmm. I just had to run back to her bedroom to get she always keeps copies of, of my, like first edition copies of, of my books. And, and this book just came, just was just mailed to me. I just got my copies. Oh. So I knew she would have one in her bedroom when she was there. <laughs> sawing <laughs> logs. <laughs> okay. Sorry about it again. Okay. I'm just going to read a, how, sh how long should I read for Lydia? Um, well, I, I mean, it's a really, <laughs> the format is very free. Um, I mean, I'd say like five to 10 minutes is a good, I mean, I would love for you to read a long time, honestly, because I just love the voice of the novel, but, and that, you know, gives me less anxiety. But you just read up until the Q&A and just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just everyone settle in. We're gonna <laughs> everyone just, yeah, that's right. Everybody's in their pajamas, you know, <laughs> teeth are brushed. Here it's very late. It's after 10. Um, oh my God. Yeah, it could, because I'm here in, in Toronto. Oh and, my God. <laughs> yes. Sorry, my, my oh. okay. time zone imperialism. <laughs> here we go. Okay. Uh, dear Dad, how are you? I was expelled. Have you ever heard of Choice Time? That's my favorite class. I do Choice Time at the Take Apart Center, which is the place in our classroom where we put on safety goggles and take things apart. It's a bit dangerous. The first half of the class, we take things apart and then Madam rings a bell, which means it's the second half of the class and we're supposed to put things back together. It doesn't make sense because it takes way longer to put things back together than take them apart. I tried to talk to mom about it and she said I should just start putting things back together sooner before Madam rings the bell. But when I did that, Madam told me I had to wait for the bell. I told Madam about the problem with time, but she didn't like my tone, which was a lashing out tone which I'm supposed to be working on. Mum is in her third trimester. She's cracking up. Gord is trapped inside her. I asked her what she wanted for her birthday and she said a cold IPA and a holiday. Grandma lives with us now. She has one foot in the grave. She's not afraid of anything. I asked her where you were and she said, that's the $64,000 question. She said she misses grandpa. 
She said that by the time she gets to heaven, he'll probably have left. Men, she said, they come and they... Today marks the beginning of our neo-realist period, Grandma told me this morning. She plunked down fried potatoes on the table and a bottle of ketchup. Fun and games, she said. She told me I have blue Nike swooshes under my eyes. She said I need to get more sleep. What's the problem, Swiv? Bad dreams? Grandma's writing a letter to Gord because that's the assignment I gave her and Mum at our editorial meeting yesterday. She gives me assignments too. We are co-editors. Our family therapist was the one who told us to write letters. But Mum says we can't afford therapy anymore if all we're supposed to do is write to missing people. Grandma says she thinks it's useful. She says we can be like reporters and have our own news desk. She says letters start off as one thing and become another thing. But Mum mistrusts them, like photos. She hates photos. I don't want to be frozen in a moment. Grandma says fragments are the only truth. Fragments of what? I asked her. Exactly, she said. She asked me what my dream was last night. I told her I dreamt that I had to write a goodbye letter using the words one and blue. Not over, Grandma said. That'll be your assignment for today, Swiftchin. She has a secret language. She didn't even ask me who the letter was for. Grandma skips over pertinent details because she's got five minutes left to live and doesn't want to waste it on the small picture. What if I had a dream that I was naked and locked out of my house, I asked her. Would that be my assignment? Nah, youngest, she said. It's happened to me many times. Grandma loves to talk about the body. She loves everything about the body, every nook and cranny. How can it have happened to you many times, I asked her. That's life, she said. You gotta love yourself regardless. That's not life, I said, being naked and locked out of your house all the time. Fun and games, she said. She was counting out her pills and laughing. After that, we had math class. Pencils ready, she yelled. If you've got a 2,000 piece puzzle of an Amish farm and you manage to add three pieces to the puzzle per day, how many more days will you need to stay alive to get it done? Math class was interrupted by the doorbell. Ball game, yelled grandma. Who could it be? The doorbell ringer is set to take me out to the ball game, which grandma forces me to sing with her during the seventh inning stretch, even if we're just watching the game in our living room. She makes me stand up for the anthem at the beginning too. Mum doesn't stand up for the anthem because Canada is a lie and a crime scene. It was Jay Gatsby. He wants to tear our house down. I went to the door and opened it and told him, it's yours for $20 million. He said, listen, can I speak with your mother? You said the last time, $25 million, I said. Sorry, said Jay Gatsby. I'd like to speak with $30 million, capitalist. Do you understand English? I slammed the door shut. Grandma said that was a bit overkill. He's afraid of death, said Grandma. She said it like an insult. He's lost his way. Jay Gatsby wants to tear down our house and build an underground doomsday proof luxury vault. Jay Gatsby bought a house on a tropical island once and then forced every other person living on the island to sell their house to him so that he had the whole island to himself to do ecstasy and yoga with ex-models. He forced all the models to take pills that made their shit gold and sparkly. Mum said he's had, he's had fake muscles put into his calves. She knows this because one day she saw him on the sidewalk outside the bookstore and his calves were super skinny and three days later they were bulging and had seams on them. Mum said he went to a place in Cleveland, Ohio to get it done where you can also have your vag tightened up if you feel like it. Then you can just sit around with your SO vaping all day with your giant fake calves and stitched up wazoo and be spied on by your modern thermostat, which is a weapon of the state they just call green because of sales and Alexa and shit and practicing mindfulness, ha 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 ha, and just be really, really, really happy that you don't have half a fucking brain between the two of you. That's how mum talks. It's probably not true. She lies. She hates words like modern and creative and sexuality, and she hates acronyms. She hates almost everything. Should I stop there? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. That's I'm no problem. I Sorry. just anyway. I'm I, I'm glad that um, people had a chance to hear you. Um, <laughs> think. Megan Megan O'Connell says heaven know, um, I mean, in the hard, chat. You know, it's, hard, it's it's actually hard to read um, like a nine year old, you know. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I guess it's hard to, to write like one too, but it's easier to write like one, I feel, than to, you know, get that tone of a child. Well, I thought, I thought you nailed it. It was, <laughs> it was very authoritative. Um, well, I, it's interesting to me that you, that you kind of have a recollection in your own life of being nine. Um, I mean, I think the, what, the, what you arrived at is very, 
that rings sort of very true and accurate to me that it's this time sort of all these anxieties suddenly loom um, and the and Swiv really does capture that kind of pre the, the stuff about the body and how mortified she is um, with the body's very presence um, with her with her grandmother and mother um, but so you know you say you kind of have access to your own con consciousness from that time period were, were you also did you like look for books where there was a child narrator? Cause I think that's always like a risky proposition, um, but you really handled it with such finesse. And I'm curious if you felt like you needed to kind of cast around and see other examples, or if you were just like, no, I'll, I'll write through this and, and arrive myself um, at SWIV. Yeah, I didn't really, um, you know, cast, I didn't really cast around for too many other examples. I think part of, part of the, um, I have been, you know, kind of reading a lot of um, books just to, like to to my grandchildren. I mean, they're they're so much younger than than nine, but often there's that, you know, that kind of um, a, a slightly older narrator that you know my grandchildren like, like we all do, kind of. I mean, you know, as kids, we don't really read books that are you know too young for us, really. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know, but I just, but I, I remember, I mean, I remember Harriet the Spy, for instance, you know, and I thought a lot about, I thought a lot about that book. I think Harriet the Spy was 11, yeah. um, <laughs> but, you know, I remember her tone. I rem um, I read, um, I read that book, Shuggy, Shuggy Bane, is that mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. a, re a recent book I read, um, you know, I, and, and other books that I, that I remember having read, um, some Roddy Doyle and, um, you know, um, even, even some Natalia Ginsburg, I think, although it's not written necessarily from the point of view, it's not narrated by, narrated by kids necessarily, but certainly from the point of view, um, mm -hmm. of, of kids. So kind of yes and no is my answer. <laughs> That's, I feel like that's due diligence. I'm, I've been reading Harriet the Spy. Actually, Megan, who was in the chat, we were talking about this because we both have been reading that to our children. Amazing. And it's it's amazing how she's like an instantly very attractive character to children, but you also realize as an adult how much kind of annotation might be needed as you're like, yeah. <laughs> like Harriet's doing this, but um, you, we should think before we do some of these things. Um, yeah, exactly. Why is Harriet doing these things? What is yeah. she upset? Is she angry? Is she worried? Is she afraid? Yes. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, um, there's a, a recent uh, biography of Louise Fitzhugh oh. um, out, and I can't remember now exactly what it's called. My son gave me a copy of it, knowing how much I loved Harriet the Spy and her other stuff. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's great. I will it's look for it. <laughs> I'm sure that's illuminating. Um, so I was, I read a, um, I'm, so I'm doing my, I'm clicking to my, clicking to my questions here, but I read, I want to get the exact words because I read an interview with a German publication. It was in English. I do not know how to speak German, but um, you were asked to describe yourself in three words and you said lazy, stubborn, and restless, um, which I, <laughs> I took, I was it was sort of heartening to hear you say that you describe yourself as lazy, but it's also like, I think this is your ninth book now that you have written. And um, so I'm, I'm curious what laziness looks like in your life. Um, and then, and also, and also I, I wonder about your, your kind of writing practice. And I know, you know, you live with family members and you have, a, you know, caregiving responsibilities. And so I'm, I just would love to hear, you know, what, what does your writing day look like? And when, where do you yeah, I aspire, I aspire to laziness. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just sort of like, if I say it, then maybe I'll, I'll become it, you know, <laughs> so lovely. Um, I am kind of lazy though, in spite of all of that other stuff. Um, but, but yeah, my writing day is, um, I, yeah, I, I always do write in, in the morning. I mean, I mean, not every morning, but if I, if I'm writing, I'm writing in the morning. Um, you know, just before all of the, you know, when do you write? Um, after every, well, if I have childcare, it's like after everyone is gone. Um, but yeah, the earlier, the better. I like. Yeah. Before the all the, you know, the, the foofara, whatever that word is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all. I don't know. <laughs> so late here. I can't speak. Um, but yeah, before all of that stuff, you know, kind of you know, floods, floods in and floods the mind and, and, um, you know, to sort of go from that, 
sleep state, dream, lucid dreaming to, to, to writing, and then just to get it over with. And mm -hmm. the rest of the day is everything else. Um, <laughs> but it always, a day is always better um, in so many ways if I have written, but you know, but I certainly don't write every day. Um, I, did you know, well, so I was thinking about the ways that, because when I started reading um, Fight Night, I was like, well, this is, you know, very different from women talking, and I'm sorry to be tedious and talk about women talking, but, you no, know, no. We, we last, <laughs> when we last spoke, that's what we talked about, and um, that's a book that really has stuck with me also, and I, I was thinking, you know, oh, wow, these books are so different, like, how did she do that, and then, and then I, you know, it was thinking about it after I finished Fight Night, and I'm like, no, you know, there's, you do explore, it, it's sort of, the women like asserting themselves and finding independence in particular circumstances do, do does kind of seem like a theme um, mm -hmm. that stretches across the books. And um, I'm wondering that that was more of a comment than a question, but um, I, I'm wondering if you have, if, if there's anything that surprises you about the way that readers, whether critics or readers in your own life um, respond to the books, um, or respond to those kind of themes as they appear in your writing? Yeah, I mean, it is kind of interesting with this one. I feel that, um, I was talking about it with my editor the other day, you know, the, she, she was saying how it m made sense to her, how I would, you know, follow women talking with a book like, like Fight Night. Writing women talking was, um, I, you know, I feel, and I, I probably, we probably talked about this, but, you know, just one of the most intense, um, experiences in my life just phys physically and mentally and to hold the, the you know the pain of those women and you know real women and to um to to serve them and to do justice to this and uh to um it you know I really thought that I was gonna die kind of literally when I like I don't know why I mean that's that sounds so melodramatic and crazy but um it was really necessary to have to stop writing that book, you know, and to, and to say, okay, it's, it's over. This is all that I can do. And, and then to move on. And, and so, um, to write fight night, you know, was a necessary, um, a really necessary, um, thing for me to, for me to write. Uh, and, um, it's kind of interesting, I guess, when people talking about the two of them and I don't read, you know, all, all my reviews or anything like that, but I did happen because a friend of mine texted me because she thought it was so funny that I think it was in the LA Times that comparing today, I think, comparing <laughs> fight night or saying, what was it? Fight, fight night is the Ted Lasso of literary <laughs> fiction. And then I thought that was so funny. I haven't really, I've kind of, I mean, I, I've kind of looked at the, at, at the show a little, a little bit and I know, you know, a lot of my, a lot of people who watch, but I just thought, wow, okay. So yeah, I just thought, you know, and I mean, it doesn't, it's not cool to respond to any of this stuff, to reviews and things like that. But I just, you know, I was, bemoaning this thing a little bit with my friend saying, wow, you know, like 30 years of like blood, sweat and tears, right? Like pouring, like, oh, you know, like, ah, trying to get this thing out. And it's like, it all like concludes, arrives at, you know, Ted Lasso. <laughs> <laughs> my so-called career. Anyway, that was funny. Um, well, it's, I did read that, I was, you know, that's doing my, doing my due diligence. And I actually haven't seen, I have not seen Ted Lasso, but I feel like I sort of understand the gist. Um, I do plan to, I just got a free Apple subscription, so I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to check it out. Um, uh, yeah, I think the, the headline was a bit um, like, wow, what a, what a state of affairs. Um, but I, I mean, in terms of, the the novel being I think healing healing for readers too and especially you know because I read it in like a I was on a family trip that after seeing family members I hadn't seen you know throughout the pandemic and and the pandemic as you know um was is a thing that has been horrible to go through for in many respects and um so yeah reading something that gave that gave such like warmth and joy um but there's I mean again again I said like that's why I sort of make why I could I could trace it back to women talking is that even though there is this warmth and joy there's still like some really fucked up things happen in the book and are 
you know, narrated and filtered through the experience of this child. Um, and it yeah. is such an anxious book in many ways, but I think that's why, I think that's why it was, it is such a good, it, it's a comforting novel for this time because that's the brain that a lot of people are living with. It's just like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I know, I feel that too, just that crazy uncertainty and, you know, and, and, and um, fear and uh, it, and also, you know, and, so, and something happened too. I mean, you know, since women talking and, and now, and that is that I have become a grandmother mm. and uh, I now have four grandchildren grandchildren and sort of in quick succession it's it seemed you know from my, <laughs> both of my children and um, I like to joke about not having taught them birth control but you know that's, 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 it's a it's a, it's it's the most amazing it's the most amazing thing in in the world and and it changes you when you when you become a grandparent it has changed me and something has happened to me and I'm an older woman now and you know I and my family we have experienced a lot of um suffering a lot of you know pain and trauma and tragedy and um becoming a grandmother I ju it just has um it, it has filled me with this joy but it has also filled me with a kind of um I feel an obligation to to be um an um an optimistic uh a hopeful presence in in my grandchildren's lives and so when I was thinking about this book I was thinking about them and I was thinking of writing a book for them and it is a book for them um it's not a it's not a kid's book but um I have them in my mind and thinking of them you know reading it later on in their lives and um and feeling it encouraged you know and a, a kind of like you you can do this you know welcome to the world here you are it's not a pretty place um, you know, <laughs> and um, life is suffering, as they say, they and, um, and it's hard and, and, and um, filled with pain. But it is also something that can be enjoyed. And, and, um, you know, and so this was my thinking all, all along. And, and so yeah, there's not I'm not, I don't want to um, not look at the at the dark stuff in fight night. Um, certainly, you know, the characters, uh, grandma and mom and Swiv, I mean, they're all, you know, um, dealing with a lot of stuff and figuring out how to survive. And, um, you know, but, but I did consciously, you know, want, want to write something that, um, you know, that went there, but went to those dark places. Um, and, and again, from the perspective of a nine-year-old girl, and that's a, that's a specific kind of thing, you know, um, you know, and, and then, and then came away from them and, and offered, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a corrective or an alternative. That's so, that's beautiful. And that, that is such a gift to your, to your grandchildren. Um, not only the novel, but the attitude. I think that's a wonderful thing that, to do. You for know, them. I mean, it is, it has just become the, the kind of um, focus of my life is to, you know, is to, is to, is to really show those kids a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that really makes the, that makes the epigraph, I think, um, really sort of resonate even more. I will read it for the benefit of our um, attendees. It is by, from John Steinbeck, and it's, an odd thing is that sadness does not necessarily become greater with age, um, which, I, I, where does that come from? What, what's staying back? Um, I read that. I can't remember exactly. I recently read um, the a, a book, uh, the sort of journals of uh, mm -hmm. Steinbeck's journals of writing *Grapes of Wrath*. Oh wow! Um, and Gra *Grapes of Wrath* was, you know, one of the first books that I read as a as a young teenager. It was assigned to me actually in an English class that really blew blew my mind, and I loved and have always loved and and his writing and and. Um, so, you know, I'm not entirely, it was just something that I read years and years and years and years ago in, you know, relation to him. Maybe he never said it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Does but, you know. We're I not going to be truthers about, <laughs> about the <laughs> Steinbeck quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hopefully, you know, yeah, it's, um, but it, but it really, but it, it stuck with me and I thought, and, and I thought, you know, in a, in a, in a weird way, it's true. I mean, you know, whether we kind of force it, I mean, as we get older and I, I don't, I don't mean to sound like some, you know, old, like <laughs> sage here, you know, but, but whether whether it's something that we kind of kind of intentionally or willfully 
create is a, is a type of ho hopefulness or a type of joy or a type of, or whether it's just something that naturally happens to people as they get older. And obviously there are all sorts of very miserable, um, you know, people and certainly our lives, uh, older people in a, and, and our lives do fill up with, with loss and pain and grief and everything like that. But at the same time, I don't know, there's something physiological or biological or something that occurs, I think, where we realize that, you know, well, it's really fucking short and we better, you know, try and try and maybe have some, have, have a good time, you know, if we can, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time, and as a writer, especially, you know, going to, going to the abyss, going to the edge, going to the shadows is so, is so necessary and looking at it and trying to process it all and craft it into some kind of, I don't know, useful thing um, is, is, you know, is, is the job, right? Is, is a writer's job, I guess. But strange things have been happening to me lately. <laughs> <laughs> Blame it on the grandchildren. But I, yeah, I'm like, well, I start weeping during the Zoom. Um, will that be a first of... <laughs> Um, author yeah, Zoom events. Family, you know, we take turns. <laughs> um, we can't all weep at the same time because then, you know, we just sink. Um, I'm going to look at our Q&A because I see them beginning to stack up. And please remember, everyone, um, if you have a question um, <clears throat> to it's it for logistical purposes, it is wonderful if you drop it in the Q&A and not the chat. Um, I... Oh, I see um, Rosemary Coleman <clears throat> has asked if you have read Rabbit Cake, um, narrator is 10 and charming. Her name is Elvis. Uh, is that by Annie, Annie Hart, uh, Hartnett? Hartnett? I, am I thinking of a different book? It's called Rabbit Cake? Rabbit Cake. Yeah, Annie Hartnett, yes. Oh, um, yeah, I'm going to write that down because that sounds great. I have not read it, but it sounds wonderful. I know she has another book coming out in the beginning, the first like three months of this year, of next year, I think, um, but I don't remember what it's called. But Rosemary, if you like Rabbit Cake, Annie Hartnett, the author, has another book coming out in cool. 2022. I'm, 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 I'm trying to, um, but, you know, tell, tell myself this on my, I'm making a note of this. Rabbit cake. Okay, go. We can go. We can go on. Well, okay, we're gonna go on. So um, we've got a, a number of questions from. Uh, oh, here we go. Great, Rosemary. Yes, thank you for bearing with me as I go through these. Okay, so Joseph, um, uh, he's got a few questions. I'm going to just maybe boil, uh, pick one. Um, let's see. Can you explain this passage? <laughs> Writers love this. Um, do you? <laughs> do, but I. But this is a, this kind of fits into I think our chat. But do you know Shakespeare's tragedies? Elvira asked. People like to separate his plays into tragedies and comedies. Well, Jeepers Creepers, aren't they all one and the same? Um, yeah, I, I guess, I, I guess, you know, again, Elvira, Grandma, <laughs> she's, she's making a joke, you know, but, but I mean, she's also, but it's also, it's part of how she, it's, it's what she feels um you know tread and it is what i feel and and it is the, you know the tragic comedy of of life and um you know the world is a funny place the world is a is a is a tragic place and how the two go hand in hand but i think that in shakespeare's tragedies and well certainly in his comedies i, th I think there's tragedy kind of little you know aspects of it in his comedies maybe not comedy comedy in his tragedies I wish that I was erudite enough to be able to answer that. My, I'm like, when I look back on ninth grade English. Um. Yeah. I don't know, but I think it's just, I think it's just, you know, just that idea that they, they really do go, they're inex inextricably entwined, these things in, in life, I feel. Um, well, Joseph, I don't want you to feel like I'm ignoring all your questions. So I'm going to, um, one, I will ask, so why, um, so talking about Swib's voice, this is again sort of what we, we talked about how um, how to figure out how to kind of write that the child voice without you know making it so precocious or so to, as Joseph is reading, Swib's voice sounds older than her nine years. Um, I mean, I I'm not sure that I agree. I mean, it's sort of I think you know we all kind of have either know or have in our minds this kind of like precocious nine year old who. Um, 
But did you, I mean, did you feel as you were writing, were you like, okay, no, this is too adult. I have to tone it back. Or were you, um, at were times, you not worried? Yeah, no, for sure. At times, I mean, I was conscious of that. I think often, you know, the erudite, um, well-spoken nine-year-old is, is, it's a bit of an armor too. Often it, it can be, you know, I think a, a performance um, saying things that may, that, you, you know, she may not necessarily under, understand, although of course, mm -hmm. you know, there is a lot of understanding there and comprehension, but, but um yeah, I mean, I, um, it's, and part of, and that's, you know, you want to, you, you, and part of the, the book, I mean, you know, the letters that both grandma and mom write were, you know, gave, gave me, I guess, that's the, whatever, to the opportunity to, to develop their characters more, because of course, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, the lives of these women from Swift's perspective. And so, I think I was feeling like, yeah, but you know, you want, you want a little bit, a little bit of something of something else than, you know, than a nine-year-old's perspective at times. And so, you know, that's what those, you know, those letters I, I feel help to, you know, provide. But um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I was always conscious of it. It was the biggest, it was the biggest, biggest, biggest challenge for sure. You know, writing the book was maintaining that voice and, um, and, and making it, you know, believable. Someone asks, I, um, have you ever wanted to give up on writing and what kept you going? Yeah, I've wanted to give up on writing every single day. <laughs> <laughs> Always. I mean, even, at, at, and especially after having finished a book, I think that's it. I can't, I can't do this again. And, and um, you know, and then what has kept me going is just that, um, you know, I, and, and again, I, um, it's so funny how, I mean, I was talking about being so old and a grandmother and et cetera. And, and yet at the same time, you know, I haven't come to any sort of understanding of myself yet really in that, in that, you know, I need to write. And, um, I mean, I do know that I will write, I have to write, uh, otherwise, otherwise, um, you know, I don't, I shudder to think, <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, it, I don't, I often, just all the time, all the time I'm battling, all the time I'm saying, I don't want to say it's very, it's like Beckett, you know, I don't want to write, you will write, no, don't write, you should write. <laughs> um, I, so I, and ultimately, yeah, I, I write to, to survive, you know, like. Um, I saw, I was, I read that, I think it just premiered the, the movie adaptation of All My Puny Sorrows was at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, were you involved in like the writing part of that or was that kind of, were you, was that out of your hands? Yeah, no, um, the, the script writer, the screenwriter and director, Michael McGowan asked me um, earlier on if I wanted to be involved and I said that, no, absolutely, absolutely not. You know, I wrote that book and I thank you very much, but no. <laughs> <laughs> can't go there again and and um yeah so uh so I wasn't but we talked from time to time you know we would meet and he would have some questions and stuff and yeah so that but no I wasn't involved in in any part of it have you seen it yeah I have seen it yeah and I feel that I'm um, the the actors who play the the sisters the two the two mm -hmm. sisters in the book um are just unbelievably great and and that dynamic that he captured you know and that they captured um was just um really phenomenal and the emotional honesty of it too I really you know I thought he and the humor you know yeah well I, that's wonderful that it because I'm I mean yeah I don't know very much about that process but I imagine it can be sort of nerve-wracking especially when if I understand the kind of material of that novel is close to your own yeah. life in many yeah. respects and so yeah that would be a sort of daunting process to be like you're gonna put the put it on the yeah, on the movie it really was I mean my my mother and my daughter and I and my partner we all went to see it you know we were all double vaxxed and you know <laughs> tested and all, all that so the, the, the protocol around COVID is very strict so we we were in the theater to see it which is thrilling not having been in a theater for so long and big screen and um it was, um, we were, I, I personally was dreading it. I, I was just dreading it. I just didn't want to go. I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't. And I, I was just so afraid, but I knew that, um, you know, I, I needed to go. I wanted, you know, and be, show support. And, um, you know, so uh, we, we went and I was really surprised by how, after, afterwards, you know, my mom and I, after, after we had seen it, the first thing that we said to each other was like, yeah, yep that's how it was <laughs> you know and uh so 
and it was okay, you know, it was, I mean, the movie was great, but uh, it was okay to have seen it. Like it, it's, you know, we survived that. Was oh, good. well that's what the, <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I could so easily go another way so that is yeah wonderful to yeah, hear yeah, and... yeah no I was, I was literally I mean I was just sick to my stomach thinking thinking about it and then I was so pleasantly um so I will ask another question actually I I was wondering this I was trying to I was like did I just miss it because I read it over the summer um does Swiv's mother this is a question from Joseph is Swiv's mother given a name in the book um, and if not, why? A nickname, which is Mushi. Mushi, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and so, you know, ag again, because Swib is writing the book, mm -hmm. you know, and, and um, yeah, yeah, it's Mushi, and she finds that out kind of through her, you know, through her mom's cousins in Fresno. Um, for, yeah, Fresno. I, I, I was not expecting the book to journey to Fresno, um, and the, 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 the and, um, that is a wonderful interlude. And a, um, you know, you never expect the great road trip is actually going to be on a plane, and it's going to be on a plane to Fresno um, with a, with a change at SFO. <laughs> um, but it is, and it and it is wonderfully executed. Um, so. Attendees, um, if you have any other questions, please ask them. Let me let me let me look to my notes here. Um, oh, Jeanette says, "Working my way through all your books and loving them all. Thank you. Appreciate the references to places I know too, as a native Winnipegger." Ah, wonderful! <laughs> Hello, and thank you. <laughs> um, do you do you revisit um, your your first your first novels are they things that you come back to or are you once you're done it's over I kind of feel that once I'm done it's it's over I might think about them they have places in in my heart I mean that sounds cheesy but you know um certainly I I, I often think of where I was at in my life and what was going on and why I wrote them and you know the circumstances of my life in which I wrote them and um but but the books themselves, I don't really, I don't, you know, I generally don't reread re them or, um, yeah. Do you? Well, I I would love to one day have a have multiple books in the rear view, um, but I can't. the The idea of picking up my book and reading it is like physically painful to me. Yeah, I, um, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't think I would ever even read a page um yeah <laughs> it's, it's not you know you just kind of think like oh you know like you it's yeah over yeah it's I'm the way that I like think of it and once I got that phrase in my brain I haven't found a better one for me but it's um it's the getting rid of the hairballs of my psyche and once it's out it's just like I don't want to look at it and it just has to be like removed yeah. discreetly <laughs> yeah, exactly the same for me and I like that phrase a lot do you mind if I use it oh please it would, be, it would be my honor <laughs> um <laughs> like you, all the every time <laughs> are, are you the, are you the kind of I know that you know the thing they always tell you to do when you finish a book or finish a draft of a book is that you're then supposed to immediately start working on the next book while like you know your editor is reading it do you do that or you to take a break or what how do you deal with that yeah I know I've heard that advice too and and it's I I mean I just can't I just can't I've I ha actually haven't haven't even ever really tried to do that I I don't know I mean it's just it, I am exhausted and spent and my head is still everything is kind of reverberating and reeling like it's with the book that I've just finished and it's just you know I think it, it just takes a while for me for things to you know fill up fill up again and um yeah, and just the rest required. I feel like every book takes, you know, such such a toll. I, yeah, so I, I don't. I know it's good advice, though, maybe. Well, no, that makes me feel better because I think, like, how does someone do that? It just seems I don't know. <laughs> wild to me that you would be able to. Yeah, um, it's like, okay, done. And, you know, five minutes later, <laughs> jump. <laughs> Here we go. Um, well, I don't see, let me... Um, I don't see any other things in the chat. Um, do you have parting words? How old are your grandkids? Grandkids. So they were all born in the last since Women Talking came out. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Yeah. Uh, well, two of them are three, okay. and two of them are babies. One is um, three months, and one is eight months. Oh my. God. 
So there, there are two. So my son has yeah two uh, girls, and my daughter has two boys. Oh, um, well, they are very lucky to have a grandmother like you, and to have a book like this um, that you have written for them. Maybe to... they'll never read it. You know, maybe it doesn't matter. Go, I, 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 Ted Lasso. I don't think so, man. <laughs> 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 well um, uh wonderful yeah um yeah any last words about ted lasso or um <laughs> john steinbeck truthism trutherism um, if the writers are, of ted lasso are um in the Indeed. zoom tonight right. we really celebrate you um yes. and i cannot wait <laughs> i've heard great things about ted lasso honestly and and yeah and i think that there's an amazing writer from snl working on it and and so it, you know it is actually flattering and so we're not we're not going to cancel you for um for, for yeah, disparaging right. <laughs> for disparaging Ted Lasso. Um, it's funny, I mean, it's just funny to get, like literature to TV. But I mean, why not? Why not? I'm going to keep my mouth shut now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the head headlines tomorrow. Marion Taves uh, dismisses Ted Lasso as not in a, a treasure of American television. Um, <laughs> Nice well, well, thank you both, uh, Miriam, Lydia, uh, for your time tonight. Um, and uh, please, everyone, go out, check out this book, check out Fight Night. It is, it is so wonderful. Um, I can't say you know enough kind things about it. Uh, and um, I think, other than that, uh, on behalf of the bookstore, uh, have a wonderful evening, and please be well, everyone. Thanks, Spencer, and thanks, Lydia. Thank thanks you, everybody. Miriam. Thanks, third place. But thank you, everybody. <laughs> and all and listening <laughs> have a good night bye thank you bye